Welcome, everyone, to the third episode of our podcast series on advocacy in the pandemic, or more specifically, how to conduct a jury trial virtually now through the pandemic. Today's session is going to focus on the advocate's experience in the virtual courtroom. What actually happens when you log on and begin to participate in your first virtual jury trial. But before we dig into the meat of it, first I'd like to introduce once again my colleagues. We have with us here today my litigation partner in Perkins Coie's New York office, Alan Howard, and our firm's Senior Litigation Consultant, Karen Lisko, who, if you're wondering what that title means, it means Karen is our litigation or our trial secret weapon. She's a jury and litigation consultant extraordinaire. While Alan and I try to do our best to master the skills of persuading judges and juries, Karen is the one who actually tells us how to do it. So I'm very pleased to have them with us here today. So to help us get started today, I actually want to talk about an experience I had just yesterday. Because I, I had a virtual hearing before a court on the other side of the country. And it was interesting because it's the fourth hearing I've had now in this court since the start of the pandemic. My first hearing was back in April when we were all neophytes to the virtual or remote world. And what was so interesting about yesterday's hearing is seeing the evolution in how the court is handling virtual proceedings. The first hearing we had back in April was a, a real challenge. The technology didn't work at the beginning of the hearing. Nobody really, including the judge and the clerks, knew what they were doing. We all kind of fumbled through it together with a lot of people on mute, a lot of inaudible audio and other mechanical problems. What was striking yesterday, and it's actually something worth bearing in mind for our remote hearings going forward, was that the court is now so experienced in conducting remote proceedings that she began the hearing, this was up for oral argument on motions, and there were about eight cases, I think, on her calendar. She began the proceeding with 20 minutes of instructions to lawyers on how to conduct a remote hearing. I think every one of her instructions was on the mark. What struck me, however, is that we need 20 minutes worth of instructions to, in order to adapt to virtual proceedings. But to give you an idea of how what some of them are and things we should be thinking about as we move forward, the instructions were as simple as asking people to test their microphones, make sure their mics are clear, to be aware of their background, which obviously my adversary didn't pay attention to because not only was she in her bedroom, but she had not made the bed behind her. And just imagine if there was a jury watching that and what they would be saying. And then interestingly, it goes back to the first concern I had with the first hearing. What do you wear? Because when we had the first hearing back in April, I didn't know when the judge got on screen, do you have to stand up? And so not only did I put on a suit and tie, but I put on the full suit just in case I had to stand up. Well, I learned right away, you don't need to stand up. So for the second hearing in this case, which was on a very warm day in June when our air conditioning was not yet operable because our building wouldn't let the air conditioning contractors in the, in the building. I wore a suit and tie and shorts and running shoes and because I knew I didn't have to stand up. And what was fascinating yesterday is the judge began the hearing saying, please don't stand up. <laughs> so I just assume she's had experiences with lawyers standing up, forgetting that they're wearing not shorts, but perhaps their undershorts underneath. So with that, let's kick it off and uh, start if we can. Alan and Karen, why don't we talk about what the lawyers should think about in terms of the courtroom and the mechanics when we begin a virtual hearing? Karen, let me start with you. In the various discussions you've had with your pilot programs and with the judges you've worked with, has there been discussion of developing any form of standard instructions to lawyers or rules for what they should do or expect as they go into a remote jury trial? You know, I've talked with some three judges in particular about this, and they are in different states, different courts, and they seem to have developed their own sets of rules. So there isn't anything standard that I'm aware of, and especially in the state of Texas where they're doing a fair number now of civil trials and jury trials by video platform, they have forms, they have instructions, they have a technical bailiff. And so they take their mock, they're not mock jurors, they're actual jurors. They take their jurors through that kind of an orientation to give them the sense of how they should comport themselves and also the lawyers. So they give the lawyers the same kind of orientation, but there doesn't seem to be a consistent set of rules or guidelines nationally. You know, Karen, that struck me again yesterday how the court delivered verbally at the beginning of the hearing a set of instructions or guidelines. But I was thinking instead of sitting here for 20 minutes with 25 lawyers online listening to all this, wouldn't it have been helpful if this had been put in a written rule or even a guideline that lawyers could have read in advance? 
Right. And in some of those jurisdictions that I mentioned, they even have YouTube videos that show you what their process is like. So I'm thinking specifically of Judge Nicholas Chu in Travis County, Texas. He has a two and a half minute video that somebody could look at through YouTube. And it shows, I believe, a screenshot of the the paper form. But he also does a compendium of how he takes especially the jurors, through the start to finish and getting them up to speed on what they need to do. So, Karen, we talked before about backgrounds and and things like that. And just curious, in a courtroom, obviously everyone is in the same setting and it's a very serious setting. It's one people are very familiar with. You also have a judge on an elevated platform, which gives a sense of control over the whole proceeding. The lawyers are separated, but they're at at tables or they're standing at a podium for their presentations. On a virtual screen, how is differentiation achieved from the judge to the attorneys to the jurors? And how can a virtual setting recreate for the attorney-jury connection that seriousness that we get automatically from being in a courtroom? Well, it's that varies too, because there are some jurisdictions where the court provides a virtual background that they require the lawyers to use. But just as often, I have seen no such background provided. The consistency I see is with the judges. The judge's background typically is the judge is sitting on the bench during the virtual trial. So it's his or her physical actual background with the flags or the seal behind them. The lawyers are often in their offices if they don't have a background provided to them, which I would underscore forevermore because it's so important to be hardwired through the Ethernet and that's not always available to us in a home office. So that's been part of the training lawyers have had to avail themselves of to know you better not have that messy bookcase. And if you do, the jurors are trying to read what's on the spine of every one of your books. It gets a lot less consistent from the jurors' background perspective because the early virtual trials had no consistent background. And you would see a juror's bed or you would see an interesting bookcase or a piece of artwork. And as hungry as we all are to try to understand the juror, we're trying to glean psychological information from their background and probably are overanalyzing it. But since then, I have seen in some jurisdictions where the jurors were given a virtual background so that that would stop. So that there wasn't that, you know, psychoanalysis going on or, or even more unfortunate, somebody trying to learn something just from the privacy of the juror's background. The only problem, as you know, is then you can't see if anybody enters the room of the juror. And there there should be no one in the room with the juror. In fact, that's part of the jury qualification process is making sure that if somebody is serving on a trial, they can confirm that they have a private place to work where it's not especially, you know, if there's confidential information coming through or you don't want the juror having a loved one who then hears part of the opening statement and then gives their opinion offline later. So those are real issues that actually then impact the virtual background. So some of the judges have given jurors no virtual background and have just said, keep it simple, keep it not cluttered, Use a blank wall if you can. But that's something we're going to have to keep grappling with if, if, in fact, the trend continues, which is an increase in remote jury trials in a lot of jurisdictions. You asked also about connection, Alan, and that one is, in my view, the one that requires the greatest flex on the advocate's part because absolutely connection has to shift It is no longer the three-dimensional you in the courtroom and the jurors getting to watch you even interact with opposing counsel. But the problem becomes that now the the, uh, advocate has to change her mind about what connection means because there is opportunity in in the online virtual jury trial. It's more intimate. Let me stop you there, because that's the key question. Many trial lawyers are legitimately concerned that they will lose the ability to connect with jurors in the virtual versus in-person environment. 
but you're learning from the mock exercises and the remote jury trials that you've, you've observed has taught you something different? Yes. It's not a loss of connection. It's a difference of connection. So it's possible in some ways to connect better because jurors already feel now like they're doing what they do m- maybe many nights. They're looking at a screen. They're they're talking to each other in gallery view as friends or as family during the pandemic. And so now, instead of friends and family appearing on the screen, it's the judge and the advocates, and it's a close-up experience. So jurors are often more comfortable, and we keep asking them this after we do either the mock exercise or when we've gotten access to actual jurors with the permission of the court about that connection. And they speak positively about their feeling of access in a way to the advocate and the judge in literally a close up and personal way that they don't experience in a courtroom. Understanding that, what would you recommend for a trial lawyer as they start preparing for a virtual jury trial to consider about altering, if necessary, their demeanor or their style to improve the connection in that environment? Well, let's start with the baseline that we know to be true and we keep learning over and over again. The greatest credibility an advocate has is to be dynamic in the courtroom, whether that's virtual or in person. But dynamism is very different online because of the very experience we keep having ourselves when we're in video conferences. There is a true flattening effect of how dynamic you feel in your own skin that does not translate as immediately when it's across a screen compared to if you're in person in a courtroom, which means knowing that, again, dynamism is a key component of demeanor and credibility. You as the advocate will need to almost feel over the top when you are using your voice and your nonverbals in this two-dimensional setting. And the specifics of that include things like volume. Like right now, I'm exaggerating my volume and I feel like I'm yelling. Now, hopefully I don't sound like I'm yelling, (laughs) but it's that feeling that I know I have to almost exaggerate some of my, it's called paralinguistics, how our voices sound. I have to exaggerate some of it to appear more dynamic in a video setting. And that's what's an important factor for an attorney to consider. Also, pausing, because it is also a fact that a slightly faster pace on video is more credible. It's also true in the courtroom. But when you're now this small version of yourself as opposed to the full three-dimensional version of you, people are going to focus even more on your voice, your face, your torso. So if you're going to be conversational, you've got to be crisp and you've got to pause after you make a key point. Otherwise, it all sounds like it's blurring together. Now, that's different, though, than than speaking slowly, which we talked about on an earlier episode, comes off as arrogance. Right. And it's counterintuitive because so many advocates over the years have, in my opinion, mistakenly thought slower is more professorial and more credible. And it's and others have been told slow down. You're going too fast. And I will say, and this is true across the board, a lot of times it's not that an advocate is speaking too quickly. It's that they're not using silence effectively. And pausing is a fabulous attention getter and is even more punctuated when you are up close and personal in a virtual trial. So Karen, let me ask you on the topic of connection. Connection maybe most important at the very start when you're selecting a jury and you have the opportunity in many cases to ask questions directly to jurors. How have you found in your experience observing mock jury exercises and real ones in the virtual world, how is jury selection affected and how can an advocate make that connection during jury selection? Well, believe it or not, actually, it starts with the judge's questioning and something I've seen with my own eyes, which is that judges seem more warm through the small screen because now everybody has the same size access 
of a jury box screen is the same gallery view as the judge's screen, as the uh, litigator's screen. And judges seem to be showing more warmth and personability in how they're talking to the jurors in their preliminary questions. So the tone is already set before the lawyer asks his or her first question. So the key is for the attorney to be alert to continuing that kind of zone. And that means, again, smiling, warmth, making sure that is then this is something that's got to be practiced that when the attorney is asking questions in a gallery view that the eyes of the attorney is scanning throughout the the gallery view just like in an actual courtroom you'd be looking at the entirety of the jury box so if the lawyer can practice that skill then the key is again to be sure to ask pointed questions of certain jurors, but to also make sure that there's good combination of group questions to keep everybody engaged. And we've learned from trial and error in that setting in the virtual jury selection, got to make sure jurors keep their hands up pretty high because some are not realizing if they're not looking at themselves that their hand isn't even showing up, but they've raised it. So there has to be more of a pause for that. But again, for the lawyer to just try to be as personable as possible through the screen and to bear in mind some of those demeanor tips that must start out coming along with the questions during jury selection itself. So let me raise, if I can, two physical aspects of what I would hope is the art of persuasion. One is, and I recall back when I took a public speaking course in college, it was ComArts 301, in fact, <laughs> the professor's pet peeve, and he would hammer it on the students over and over again when we were engaging in speaking exercises, was the hands. Uh -huh. He absolutely hated speakers whose hands were on the podium. And he would lecture, lecture us ad nauseum about, get those hands off the podium. If your hands are stuck to the podium, you're stuck, and your body freezes, and you become boring. I remember those lectures. <laughs> We have no choice when we're on camera. We can't have the physicality of being the freedom of being able to move our bodies around, or do we? I mean, it, does the physicality of communication play a role when you're confined basically to a chair staring at a web camera? Think about the evening news. Think about news anchors and how now that is a skill set that advocates are required to employ, just like a lot of news anchors are still sitting at a position where you only see torso up. It does require a difference, though, because of the camera. So I, I am with that professor in terms of freezing yourself or holding on too hard to something. In fact, a really good advocate probably is good because they've got some adrenaline coursing through them. And that chemical has to be burned. So sometimes a good advocate with good illustrative gestures burns that chemical, but they have to have control over their gestures. Here's what I mean. An illustrative gesture is one that is intentional. Like if the advocate wants to say there are two reasons you should find for my client, now you just can't have the number, put your fingers up with two really close to the camera because it creates something called monster hands. So if somebody is pushing toward the camera like they normally would in a courtroom, it backfires. So, so any gesture has to be closer to your head and it has to be closer to your body because it has to be up high enough to be seen, but it can't be so close that it's creating this bizarre monster hand effect. So speaking of news anchors, are you a fan of the Scott Pelley chew on your uh, reading glasses uh, approach? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But all kidding aside, Karen, your comment actually reminds me of one of the advocacy tips that the judge gave yesterday in her 20-minute instructions. She suggested to everyone that they have the setting the particular platform we're using was blue jeans, but it's irrelevant, that allows you to see yourself. And she said, you want that image of yourself up there so you know what you look like to me. Absolutely very, right. Very, very savvy tip from the judge. Although You're I would add to that, Ed, objects are larger than they appear when it comes to these virtual trials or settings, because even in what that setting yesterday, you saw a smaller version of you than what she might have been seeing or the other side might have been seeing since they can have a little control over which view they're looking at. 
So be alert to that. Uh, absolutely. And that's the perfect segue to the second point I wanted to raise of physicality, which is view, because we haven't talked about that. To what degree should the advocate advocate for a certain view setting on the screen so the jury sees the advocate in a certain way? Do you want the view with the speaker in the large portion of the screen and the rest of the participants in small gallery style of view? Do you want the gallery picture? Because if it's a gallery picture, all the jury's ever seeing is a postage stamp size of whomever the lawyer is at that moment. The problem I see with the speaker focus is it can get dizzying at times, particularly when multiple people are talking and, and the screen flashes back and forth between large images of Alan and Karen and the judge and the juror who just hiccuped and therefore got the mic and got the, uh, the image on the screen. And I'll, you, throw, I'll throw a part B about there, if you can answer it. A, the lawyers, when they're presenting, and B, our witnesses. Do we want our witnesses big and appearing, or does that enhance credibility, or is that more opportunity uh, to find fault? Those are all great questions, because there's another variable, and that is how much power do you have to influence? Because there are now vendors getting in the game of tailoring the platform for courtrooms. And some of that tailoring is even jurisdiction specific. In those settings, the tailoring creates one view option. But still, Zoom is the number one preferred used video of platform by many courts, at least as of today. And so if that's the case, it's not a tailored one and there is more power to influence it. But most platforms default, as you know, and they default to, especially if there's an exhibit up on the screen or a PowerPoint demonstrative slide, it, it defaults in a way that makes me crazy as someone who coaches people in persuasion. It defaults to making the speaker tiny and the slide large. And that's the exact opposite way it should appear. Even though, of course, you know, whether it's a witness or an advocate, that you want to be able to see what's on the screen if it's a document or an exhibit or some kind of a demonstrative. So I, you know, going back to the initiative of this question, I strongly recommend coordinating with the court before anything launches and in invites the jury in to influence what that looks like, even if it's a hearing. So that you've got the ability to suggest, could we at least see about doing a side by side ratio? So that, it, and, and remember, side by side is a bit of a variation because you also are going to have probably a video of the judge. You're going to have a video once the jury enters of the jury. So now you've got less real estate on the screen. So it's even more important to make sure that you as the advocate or your witness is bigger than the default usually allows. So I advise people all the time now to have an overt conversation, whether it's the court, whoever the technical bailiff is, sometimes that's a court clerk, sometimes it's a judge, sometimes it's a trial technologist who comes in from the outside. But to have that conversation, it's very, very important. And the witness part is a big deal because jurors have opportunity to now see the witness closer up, just like they do with you, because in a large courtroom, they're much, much further away. So it's important to actually capitalize on that because it does create more connection. Is this a view, is this view issue considered one in control and personal to each advocate? So one side can choose to have one uh, variation of views and the other can choose something different? Or is it viewed as something that has to be standard and, and neutral for all sides and, and one size fits all? In my experiences, it's been the latter. It's one size fits all, which is, again, why it's important to get in that conversation. And I think that there's some wisdom to trying to reach agreement with opposing counsel in advance. Hammer that out so you're not sparring in front of the judge about what view is the preferred view. And certainly, you know, the judges who are doing this a lot, they already, of course, have their own opinion about it. And I have to tell you, the more I interview judges, the more impressed I am. They are savvy and they have gotten in to the mode of what's effective very quickly. They've pivoted. So they may actually have already figured out that it is important to do what I'm urging, which is to make sure that the view of the presenter or the view of the witness is as big as possible. Well, that raises another interesting 
question and maybe opportunity with presented by technology. Now, in, in a live courtroom, the judge and to a lesser degree, the the advocates have some control over what the jury might see, the physical layout of the courtroom, how the parties comport themselves and whatnot. But at the end of the day, nobody controls the juror's eyes. And we all know, and we spend so much time looking at the jury during trial to see what they're looking at and what seems to be resonating with them. Technology could allow jurors to have control over what they view. Now, have any courts experimented with that, actually giving jurors control, much like most of us are accustomed to when we're on a Zoom or WebEx or BlueJeans meeting? All of us play games with the views. We all do. it. Yeah, and the attorneys would be blind to what the jurors are doing. Yeah. Has anybody considered allowing the jurors that freedom? I have, again, I have not encountered any where the jurors have that freedom. It's usually a static view where the jurors don't get to play. But it does raise the fact that now, you know, like you mentioned, Ed, how we're often watching the jurors watch you. We Let me just tell you a very maybe disappointing fact about that. Looking at somebody's nonverbals when they're not speaking, in other words, the jury sitting there watching you, is highly unreliable. And I've been humbled over and over again. There are times I've been called by a client who said, could you come watch the jury, watch us? And I'll tell you, 100% of the time, just knowing what's true about nonverbal communication and courtroom, I've said, do not spend your money on me doing that. Let me just give you thoughts on persuasion overall. And that's where you've got the control. Because a lot of times you'll see a juror who's nodding her head throughout the trial at you and you think, I, we've got her. And then sure enough, we interview that juror after the trial's over and you didn't have her. But she's just so used to shaking her head. So there's a lot of unreliability. But having said that, now in these Zoom trials or whatever the platform is, jurors in some of these are able to watch each other. Now, that's not typical, but now they're watching each other react to a witness. And I've seen some pretty astonished faces, depending on what the jurors were seeing or being shown. So we're all pretty expressive generally. And so that is another factor to be alert to, that sometimes they're able to see each other react. But we're not going to know that. Because we can't, we can see their reaction, but we don't know what their reaction is to because they have multiple images on their screen. Right. Right. There's a lot going on on the screen in a virtual jury trial. I was going to say, that's what Karen was saying a moment ago. I mean, we can be sitting in a trial and somebody can say something and a juror might smile and whatnot. We think, aha, that struck. And it could be the juror was just thinking about what they're going to have for dinner that night. Exactly. At that point, but, 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 right. but, but, but. The more common experience is, you know, go, don't go to that extreme, but you're presenting evidence. You've got an exhibit up. You're highlighting something in front of a witness. And you can tell if a jury is picking up on what you're arguing, if they're getting it, if they're reading it, and it's having an impact generally. You can't tell whether how they'll ultimately view the document in terms of the case, but you can tell pretty well that they get it. They understand it. And I worry that that would be lost when you're presenting evidence in front of a virtual jury and they're reacting to maybe looking at some other juror. You don't know exactly what they're looking at and what they're reacting to. So it is a different dynamic than if you're standing there right in front of the jury live in a courtroom. Right. Because there is more they can visually shop in that virtual setting. Now, I will say there's something that has been an upside with exhibits and that is sometimes you see a juror lean in and squint like you can tell they're trying to read whatever you put up in front of them in a share screen view and you can sometimes see the struggle in a way that you cannot in the courtroom so it has allowed for attorneys to pivot if they're noticing that juror struggle non-verbally and make sure that they're getting either a more crisp view etc And I was just part of a preparation for a hearing where the litigators were using a document camera like an Elmo. They were to show some physical and physical evidence. They were using PowerPoint. And then there were times they were using neither. And it was just the view of the attorney. And they did a masterful job because they practiced and practiced and practiced at doing it. But it, it reminded me in thinking about the virtual jury trial, 
that anything persuasion often happens through the unexpected. And too many attorneys get lulled into, like in my opening, I'm just going to have slide after slide after slide after slide. And you never keep the juror's attention as much as if then you varied it and sometimes had no slide, which means probably you have to create a black slide. Or you switch over with the help of a trial technologist to a document camera. And they were showing an electronic part. They were showing tiny parts in this actual hearing. And they succeeded. It was better than I thought it would be. So people were pivoting. I I can understand that because pre-pandemic, when doing jury trials in federal courts, they're now more equipped with screens in the jury box. And I found it easier to use documents and walk juries through documents. You're not dealing, when I started out, it was boards, Uh, (laughs) but then even a screen from across the room and you can't really tell how it's translating from a distance. But when you actually see jurors reading on screens right in front of them in the courtroom, there's a benefit there. And that benefit would seem then to translate right over to the virtual environment. Well, I think that's that's something very important for us to remember, because I'm sure we've all had this issue where we're on a video conference and somebody's using screen share and you really can't see the document well. And what I often do, I mean, I've had meetings like board meetings where the screen share is there, but as long as I have the board book, I open it myself on my second screen and I go through it myself because I can pick the view, I can expand the font so I can read it with my poor eyes. If we're feeding the jury what they're seeing, we've got to be very cognizant of what they're seeing and that some of them have vision as poor as mine and won't see it well. Also underscores, I think, the need to, just as we do in a physical trial, make sure the exhibits in an accessible form are available for the jury when they're deliberating. Right. Go back and see that, especially for us as commercial litigators, where so often it's the language in a contract that's at issue in the case or the disclosure that was in a in a proxy statement or whatnot, we've got to be sure the jury can access it and access it easily. And again, it's one thing when you hand them a stack of physical exhibits like we used to do, and they can thumb through and find the page. If we're going to give them a virtual set of exhibits in the jury room, we better make sure it's easy for them to access what they need to look at and see what they want to see. Right. And thinking about, you know, we've talked about a technical bailiff. Sometimes it means by default, you have to figure out hopefully among the jurors, is there a technical juror? Because some are more adept at accessing an electronic file folder than others. Some would never know where to start. And especially if the court hasn't issued a standard kind of device, some jurors are not using the best kind of thing. They might be on their phone, which is highly, highly discouraged. And as a matter of fact, some courts just don't even allow it. But they might be using a tablet that they can't use quite as in a facile way as if it's a laptop. So what you're saying in the next iteration of 12 Angry Men, not only will it, of course, be 12 Angry People, but <laughs> the, the dominant juror will be the one who actually has the technological capability and can draw all the others together around him or her or them. Maybe so. So, Karen, you've given us some tips on demeanor in how to connect with the jury and how to be persuasive in our presentation uh, as advocates to a jury in a virtual setting. How do we prepare our witnesses for their demeanor and ways they can uh, establish their credibility and connect with the jury? Well, the good news is there's significant overlap in what I've said in terms of nonverbals and paralinguistics or how our voices sound when it comes to witnesses as well. But even an experienced witness gets a bit unnerved when they are now in this new setting of a remote jury trial. So they've got to go through practice in the actual platform. It's often called sandboxing. So you're, it's because the analogy is you're playing in the sandbox. But in this scenario, the sandbox better be the actual platform because think about how many platforms you might be in and out of talking with clients through the course of a day. They all vary a bit. And the last thing you want a witness to worry about is how to get to the right screen or how to think about what their camera angle looks like. So at Perkins Cooley, we actually have a witness kit that we provide to a witness to make sure he or she has 
the right equipment, the right camera, the right monitor if they need to have a second monitor so that they don't have to worry as much about, do I have a home set up if I am testifying from home that is adequate? And if, as you can imagine, it does take more practice. And then when I help prepare a witness to testify for a trial, we will also record the witness, give the witness the ability to see how he or she comes across. And we always say, your job is to testify as effectively and truthfully as possible. But a nervous witness in a video platform can come across as passive sometimes arrogant because they're nervous and they're too slow, for example, like I talked about before. And so the goal is to also get a witness to think about the fact that he or she is hosting her answers and that his job or her job is to put the jury at ease. And so bottom line on that, the witness needs to be both competent and warm. But we often don't think about as a witness that our job is to be warm. We think, I'm the receiver of a question, so I just need to answer the question. But that is not credible, whether it's in the courtroom or if it's virtual. So the witness whose mindset is, I need to make sure that I almost host the jury in my answer and take care of the jury in explaining my point, is the witness who often then brings warmth in their demeanor and in their persona as they testify virtually. One piece of core guidance that we give to witnesses in jury trials in person is to maintain the same demeanor on cross-examination as they have on direct examination. Obviously, the, the, the style of the questions and, and, what, and the answers is going to differ, but how the, the witness appears, the comfort level in answering those questions, the jury picks up on that. I would imagine that's actually probably easier in the virtual environment when they're in a comfortable setting to maintain the same demeanor. Well, and a number of attorneys I've spoken with say they think attorneys are behaving themselves more in the virtual courtroom. So in cross-examining... I wouldn't always count on that with trial lawyers. (laughs) Let's hope it becomes the case. But that that if that's true, then there may be a leveling out where there's not quite as much drama. Because one thing, even in cross-examination, when you you really don't want to pillory that juror is knowing you get too over the top in a small screen, it can backfire against the lawyer. In, in a very different way than if you're in a massive courtroom in federal court somewhere. There, it pixelates out virtually in a, in a courtroom setting by the physicality of it. So you can be more dramatic. But when you're in a small screen, it can look like you're being a bully more than it would if you were in person. Well, you also are eliminating one of the most common sources of lawyer misbehavior in trial, which is physical misbehavior, you know, the, the lawyer who gets too close to the witness during cross, that old uh-huh. game, getting closer and closer and getting right in the witness's face until the judge tells you to back off. Or uh, we've all seen this lawyer who throws papers across the table or throws down a pen and has to get admonished by the judge. I guess if they do that now, they're throwing the pen down on their own desk. So who cares? <laughs> they, they I, could, I could see lawyers getting up close with the camera. <laughs> like really yeah. big. Or... You know, like the physical, the nonverbal reaction when opposing counsel is questioning. I mean, certainly you can manipulate that in the virtual jury trial, too, and be like, (sighs) you know, heavy sigh. Although the lawyers are sometimes muted, except if they've got to object, they've got to be unmuted for that part of it. But they can still make their big over the top rolling of the eyes and any kind of small movement when a jury is watching the same screen hour after hour is going to draw their eye. So lawyers can actually still accomplish some of that drama from what they're doing facially and how they're moving their head around or throwing their hands up, even if they're silent. What you just said raised another idea with me, which is you know, something I always try to follow and, and have people on my trial team follow is to maintain poker faces. No matter what the evidence is, you don't want the jury seeing you react poorly to something or overreact. And that's especially true in the virtual setting, too, because you have no idea where the jury's eyes are. Right. They could be looking at you, but if you're looking at at their profile, it looks like they're just looking off camera. 
You don't know how their screen is exactly set up. So while you can feel eyes on you or, or uh, in, in the courtroom, you have to just assume eyes are on you at all times in the virtual setting. And there is a level of complexity to that because poker face is one thing, listening face is another. And I talk to litigators all the time about the fact that you should still be alert that exactly what you just said, Alan, you're being watched even when you're not speaking. And so the the jurors, I used to say in the, you know, in-person courtroom back in the day when we actually got to be together, jurors have great peripheral vision. You may think they're not looking at opposing counsel's reaction. They're catching more than you know. They tell us that after trials are over. But the key when you're in the screen and you're the opposing counsel watching and listening to cross-examination of your own witness is to know that you should balance poker face with having an engaged face, looking like you're attentive. Because a lot of times, what I see is the opposite problem, where attorneys get so passive in their expression that they look like they're not even paying attention. And jurors notice that. And they don't, they draw all kinds of conclusions about us, just like we're drawing conclusions about them. So it's important to appear engaged and alert without going to the extreme of over the top can look distracted like you're looking at your phone or uh, watching something off screen too. Whereas, you know, in court, there's some people at counsel table that can be on their laptops. They look like they're taking notes uh, of the of the proceeding. I would imagine if your face is on screen during a virtual trial, you need to be listening and paying attention to the evidence. Well, and if, if your witness is testifying, everybody who's at your virtual counsel table should be paying attention because the jury is going to pick up on whether you're engaged with your own witness. Even if you're not the first seat trial lawyer putting on that witness, it's very important for everybody in that virtual table. That actually provides an opportunity to talk about two other audiences because we've been talking principally about the jury and to some degree about the judge. But I think I know lawyer misbehavior in trials is rare, but when it does on occasion happen, often the audience that's being it's the target of the misbehavior is not the jury and not the judge, but is either the clients or the public. And yes, some lawyers do use the opportunity at trial to showboat or, or in fact, try a case to members of the press or the public who are in the room. Now we're in a virtual setting. Has the virtual setting changed those dynamics in terms of lawyers playing to other audiences as opposed to just the jury and the judge? For savvy lawyers, it has because they should be alert to the fact that many of these trials are streaming live to anyone who wants to go on the Internet and watch. So the access to the public has just exploded you know, it's no longer what are the confines of the courtroom and the, the seating in the gallery. Now it's anybody nationally who's alert to the fact that there's a trial going on and you just have to get to the correct website to be able to watch it yourself. So if a, if a lawyer is thinking, sure, I, I care about what's happening in this trial, but Perhaps this is something that's going to replicate itself for future trials. Now they may be trying to have some kind of influence over prospective jurors in future trials that are related. You know, if it's a bellwether trial. So that's a whole other issue. It's a, it's a really important question you raised because it, it could have effect in a way that none of us have anticipated. Hmm. You know, it, it is fascinating because if I go back decades when I, when I was a law clerk, we all knew that in this particular courthouse, there was a group of trial watchers, and they were by and large a group of about a dozen, mostly male, who they were, mostly retirees, and they were in the courthouse almost every day. And I heard their conversations at times. They would talk to each other about what trials are going on in the courthouse today, and occasionally you'd see all of them running in a group to a certain courtroom because they heard something interesting was happening. Well, now, magnify that by a thousand. Right. So we can have a community out there that is buzzing around virtually to find the interesting trials and pay attention. And it may not just be retirees looking for interesting entertainment. It could be people engaged in various, whether it's the press or competitors or, as you said, prospective jurors. It could be any of those groups. Do we have to now try our cases to a much broader audience? Well, and they may have been recruited by one team or the other. 
If you've heard of shadow juries before, that has been a phenomenon for many years. And that means that in a normal courtroom, you've got people who have been recruited blindly. They don't know which side has hired them, but they are recruited to have some similar characteristics to the actual seated jury. And in the, in the days of the actual courtroom setting, they would sit in the back of the courtroom every day and then be interviewed at the end of each day by typically a trial consultant to find out what did the shadow jurors think was clear, what was vague, what was persuasive, what are their ongoing perceptions? Well, think about that now in a virtual trial. Now you can recruit those jurors. They're not obviously showing up in the virtual courtroom. They can also be watching from the privacy of their own home and be interviewed, again, blind to who the identity of the the paying side is to get their reactions as well. Well, and also they could be re- viewing recorded uh, a, a recorded record of the trial itself, because there's virtually no way once something is broadcast on the web to prevent other people from recording it. Right. So uh, a, a shadow jury or other consultants could be shown the trial proceedings in non real time and develop right. reactions of that nature. Right. Karen, I know there's a, been a, a small sample size, but do we have any indication yet whether the move to virtual trials would favor one side or the other, plaintiffs or defendants? I'm part of the online courtroom project, and we've been talking about that very question this week because some have asked, is there a trend? And the answer that we know tracking nationally is no, not yet. And in fact, just talking anecdotally for those of us who are actively participating, some of some people were saying, oh, we think it would help the plaintiff in this setting. And some other very smart people would say, I think it would help the defense in this setting. So the big fat answer is it seems to be a wash right now, partly because some people are thinking, well, okay, plaintiffs have no opportunity now to create that warmth and the emotion and the drama and the sympathy because it's virtual. And I've already said, I disagree. In fact, we've seen more immediacy, more intimacy on the screen. And in the simulations we ran, we were running one where we had a witness actor, but she was a witness who was crying and she had a mask on and the jurors missed a bit of obviously her facial expression, but they still got it in terms of her emotion. On the other side, the defense is worried because they worry that that intimacy could create an expanded advantage for plaintiffs if there is that kind of drama coming from the plaintiff, depending on the case. Yet, you know, that nine-week Zoom jury trial that I've mentioned, it ended in a full defense verdict. And it was, I believe it was an asbestos trial. So it included some physical damage, emotional distress, et cetera. So if, if there was any feeling that it's just a slam dunk for plaintiffs, that's not necessarily the case. Even, even that said, though, still right now, a wash. Well, Karen, we can't thank you enough for all of this uh, information. And most of all, for the comfort that as we continue in a pandemic for many months to come, the option of a virtual jury trial is very real and very viable. And that there may even be some benefits to the remote experience that could live beyond the pandemic. Although I I do note that as we're recording these sessions and we've hit the third wave of illness in the country, there are states and effectively, uh, especially states courts that are running out of money and may not have the technology to make this pivot to the virtual environment and are putting off the trials. So there may be fewer of them than we would like to see. You know, I, I, all true. And the biggest thing I would say in closing is that there's incredible acceleration in what the courts seem to have figured out if and when they can do the remote jury trial. And that's, you know, hopefully some of the things we've conveyed in these podcasts, but also knowing that a lot of these judges are highly accessible. There is, for example, there's a an eight-hour 
free link to a summit that was co-sponsored by the National Institute for Trial Advocacy, NIDA, and the Online Courtroom Project, or OCP. So if you go to either of those groups, if you Google it, you will find that free link, and it's full of judges and attorneys who have been in the trenches, literally sharing their wisdom about it. So to the extent that there are those listening who are thinking, well, I guess it's about to happen, but where do I start? It's also possible to get some real world access to what other lessons people have learned. So it doesn't have to be a from scratch experience. Well, and it might be worth, you know, giving our audience a sense of where we are today when we're recording this, because today is the day that we expect the FDA to give approval to the first vaccine for COVID-19. And so hopefully we are somewhere in the neighborhood of the low point of this pandemic, I'd rather call it a low point than a high point, where many of the constraints that we've seen on ordinary proceedings are in place. Hopefully, again, six months, 12 months from now, things will be much closer to normal than they are now. But I think part of the takeaway of the exercise and everything we're learning is aspects of remote proceedings are going to be with us to stay. So while we may not have fully remote trials for more than a few months now, um, I think elements of this technology and this learning will be with us for the future. And it's a question of what have we learned? How can we use it? And what will we carry forward? And again, experiences like I had yesterday to start go back to where we started from. I was in a hearing across the country yesterday. I didn't have to leave, in this case, my home office. There were tremendous savings in that for our client. And I think it eased the matter of scheduling for the court to assemble people together virtually. I think we're going to continue to see that in the future. And elements of that, I think, will continue to affect even jury proceedings when as soon as it can come, the pandemic is behind us. I think a lot is the word possible is entering our vocabulary in a way we never would have anticipated. So there are certain things, like you just said, that are now possible and viable. It'll be really interesting to see where we are a year from now.